for mine. Isn't it? Write it on an easy topic because it covers everything. <laughs> so, okay. Let's um, see where we go with that. So we do what the, the lamas would say is set our motivation. We might say it's like state our purpose. You know, why are we here together? Well, it's to listen, think about, analyze, contemplate, internalize if you choose to. Um, basically, Buddha's views about the mind, happiness, suffering, what's possible, how things exist. That's the idea. So we think we so that we can develop our own amazing potential, use this information as tools to help us develop our own amazing potential. So on the other hand, because we live in this crazy world together, be of use to others. That's the idea. I'll just sing a little Tibetan prayer that expresses that. Sange chadam soke chognam la janchu badu dagni kyapsu chi. Dagi chunyan gipe sonam ki, Jola pencher sange drupa shog, Sange chadam soke chognam la, Jan chubadu dagni kyapsu chi, Dagi chunyan gipe sonam ki, Jola pencher sange drupa shog. Sange chadam soke chognam la, Jan chubadu dagni kyapsu chi, Dagi chunyan gipe sonam ki, Jola pencher sange drupa shog. Um, yeah, so when I know when I first heard, oh, where's the echo coming from? What, which sound do we have to turn off, Sonny? Which one? Maybe my sound. Maybe mine off here better. So turn that one off. Keep the faces on, but just turn the sound off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I know when I first heard the Buddhist teachings from Lama Zopa a few years ago, uh, I, remember, I didn't have a single, I had no idea what he was talking about. I mean, I heard the words, but, um, well, first of all, because what's interesting, you know, I mean, that was in the mid 70s and it wasn't, it was probably 15 years before that, just 15 years, maybe, yeah, 15 years that, that, that the Tibetans had even come, you know, from from Tibet. And somehow they were kind of locked on the other side of the mountains there. And you could say, if you hear teachings from, you know, and Lama Zopa is very traditional, speaking in English, but still very traditional, the way they frame things is literally still medieval. I mean, the way, you know, if you read a text from the medieval times and all the texts we study are there, the, the way they talk is exactly like that. So nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's um, it's kind of ancient and it was hard, it was very arcane. It was hard to get your head around it, you know. But if you really, so what I'm learning over the years, you strip away, strip things to their essence, you know. Buddha's expertise is the human mind, that's it. And that kind of a surprise to us because I think we have, we're so addicted to um, distinguishing spiritual is one thing and psychological is another very strongly i mean some people as buddhists feel it's insulting buddhism to call it psychology but that's the only and that's only because you have a view of psychology that's kind of set in stone you know i mean psychology is the fancy word it's greek for the, to dealing with the mind isn't it and that's buddha's expertise dealing with the human mind what is what is meditation it's a function of the mind we mystify i think mean, we hugely mystify don't have to have my echo. We don't want that. Where's Sunny? What happened, Sunny? What are you doing about it? I don't want my echo, do we? None of us wants my echo, do we? What, darling? Can we turn off the sound from there? Just turn the sound off, darling. That's all. Off? Just turn it off. The sound. the sound. Turn the volume down to nothing. Perhaps. Yeah. 
On you? No? And I'm saying you. What? That's off now. There you go. So easy. Good. Okay. You know, so I, I know that recent people, um, uh, I put these videos on Instagram and different places every every few days, you know, someone puts them on for me. And I and talking a lot about the mind, the most recent one, people ask questions, of course. So someone sends me the questions. I don't go into, I don't go into these. I don't go into it. I just happen not to. It's okay. But someone asked me the questions. And I remember one person, I mean, we, we talked about how, and then I'm going to talk about this tonight. It's such a simple concept, but it's because it's so utterly not how we think in our culture, psychologically or the neuroscientific model, it almost sounds mystical, you know. It sounds genuinely puzzling to us. So we can say, I think in our world, in our life, we talk, we, we can make a really clear distinction between thoughts. When we point up here, we mean the intellect, don't we? And you know, if you're learning math, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're training your mind to have very sophisticated thinking. It's very simple to think that way. You're studying classical music. You're learning very complex mental things. If you're studying how to be a trader, you know, anything, uh, whatever it is, we, we, and we're very brilliant at that in our culture. We can, we can mold our intellect into the most amazing shapes. But it's all thoughts, isn't it? One plus two is a thought. Well, what's shocking to us is to hear that when I'm screaming with anger at you because you are harmful to me, how dare you do that to me? I hate you. I'll kill you. You're the cause of all my suffering. To say that anger is also merely thoughts sounds like a joke. Why is that? And that's because we're so addicted to this um, distinction between clear, rational thinking and then what we call emotions. But actually, the Buddhist view is very clear. That we, 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 we so in the way when you study the Buddhist view of the mind, you learn one 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 thing you learn for a start. And I'm just going to say it very simply: is we got there's two ways the mind works. Two ways our mind functions. One is sensory consciousness. This is a, and this is a really interesting point actually. One is sensory consciousness, and one is mental consciousness, and they are distinctly different. So what is so what does it mean sensory consciousness? So it's very interesting this. So as far as the Buddhist view is concerned, our sensory consciousness is the word mind and consciousness are usually often used synonymously. So I'll spell it out. What your eye consciousness is referring to is that part of your mind, your capacity for cognition, that's the job of the mind, is to cognize. So that part of your mind that depends upon the eyeball and various nerves, all the nice, all the things working nicely. That's your eye consciousness. And so every part of your mind, from the Buddhist perspective, every part of your mind cognizes something. It always has an object. Mind is like the subject. They refer to a subject. And it always has a thing that it cognizes. So then you have to ask the question, what is it that eye consciousness cognizes? What is it that ear consciousness cognizes, that tactile consciousness cognizes? What are the objects of those consciousnesses? Well, the, the, the sensory consciousness is from the Buddhist perspective are like dumb animals with respect to dumb animals. They are really profoundly limited in their capacity for cognition, but we give them unbelievable power. And this is really an eye opener if we can take this in our daily lives, you know. So, you know, I, I, I will use the example, I might look over here to this mug and I would say, well, it's a very nicely designed mug. It's a very pretty mug, you know, I like the look of that mug. The color looks pe pleasing to me, you know, I would say that it's a nice, it's a very pretty mug. So obviously, without any without any question, we would all assume when I say that, that my eyes are seeing a pretty mug. Well, from the Buddhist perspective, it's just literally not true. The eye consciousness can only cognize two things, shape and color, that's it. Ear consciousness can only cognize sound. Taste consciousness can take like sweet, sour. In other words, they're profoundly limited in their capacity for cognition. And this is really, it's powerful if we can get this and see it in our daily lives. We clearly give power to the eye consciousness that it literally doesn't have. So if it's, if it's true then that eye consciousness 
can only cognize shape and color. And it can't even articulate that because that's that's the function of mental consciousness. So then, so then what happens? What part of you have to ask the question then, what part of my mind is cognizing a pretty mug? What part of my mind is cognizing an ugly sound? Well, it's not your sensories. The senses play a role. They're there every millisecond. They're the doorway between us and the universe. It's very clear, isn't it? But they've got this profoundly limited capacity for cognition. So you have to ask the question, what part of my mind? Well, that's the mental consciousness. So it, what's happening is, and because we're totally programmed, I mean, the only reason I say that's a pretty mug, because I know it's a mug for a start, and I'm, I've retained that memory. Then I'd say over the years in this life, forget about life, past lives, I've developed a certain kind of a, a taste for certain things, certain shapes, certain colors, you know. So that when the overall one, there, my eyes see it, and then instantaneously, I'm not joking, quicker than Google, your mental consciousness is accessed. And that's where your workshop is, as long as I put it. That's where the workshop is. So what's fascinating about the mental consciousness in from the Buddhist perspective. And we're not discussing the brain here. Buddha's expertise is not the brain, okay? Because for him, from the Buddhist perspective, this is fundamental. The whole of Buddhism would collapse into a heap of utter, utter irrational nonsense if we if we can prove that Buddha's mistaken, that your consciousness is by definition not physical. Well, so we'll take that as our, our, our view here, take it as our assumption here, you know, our working hypothesis. So you, you've got your sensory and your mental. Now, at the mental level, there's these two, there are two levels at which mind can cognize. And this is what's interesting. And this is unique to the Buddhist view. You've got, the, you've got the grosser level, the level that we function at day to day, and that's called conceptual. And then you've got these subtler levels, which we only access once we've accomplished this marvelous concentration, this samadhi, this genius state of being that these i mean these state of being at a subtler level of our mind it's not mystical it's mystical for us in the modern world because we don't have we don't have any equivalent techniques so we think it's mystical you know but these genius indians more than three thousand years ago were the ones who 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 accessed who learned this brilliant skill to focus the mind and therefore learn to access subtle, literally, don't mystify it, literally subtler levels of their own mind, subtler levels of their own capacity for cognition. The, the best we can say, and the best we can do is use those words. We can't, we can't imagine it because we have no equivalent in modern, certainly not in modern psychology, certainly not in neuroscience. But this is very real. It's not mystical. There are subtle levels of our capacity for cognition. So we live at the grossest level, and that's called conceptual. Now that includes all the all the the, the conceptual, all your 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 clever intellectual thoughts about music, math, Lord knows what. We we are very brilliant at that. But it also includes. This is what I'm getting to now. The biggest surprise of all. It includes all of our emotions, what we call emotions, whether it's called love, compassion or, you know, complete rage, so-called negative, so-called positive, so-called productive, so-called useless, neurotic, delusional thoughts, delusional emotions. And this is the key point in Buddhist psychology. He makes this absolute distinction in the mental consciousness between the neurotic, eye-based, fear-based, distressing, delusional, uh, disturbing, afflicted, all these words, states of mind such as attachment anger jealousy blah 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 we all know them and the other ones called love compassion intelligence you know um patience forgiveness you name them we these words are so simple you know but they're not the way we talk in modern psychology it almost sounds too simplistic and it also sounds a bit religious but this is the way that buddhism describes the mind so so the the, the so the thing is when we learn so the, the Buddha's deal is we can learn, as Lama Zepa puts it beautifully, we can learn to mold our mind into any shape we like. Now, we know that when it comes to science, music, math, you know, all the sciences that we and the artistic pursuits and we are so brilliant at. We absolutely know that you can start knowing zero thoughts about music to, begin, to becoming an absolute genius musician. And we know that means you radically, radically, radically changed your mind into a really 
you know, into, into becoming familiar with really complex, complicated concepts called musical theory. We don't speak about it like this, but we know it's possible. We know we can mould our mind into a musician. We can mould our mind into a carpenter. We can mould our mind into, into any one of those things. We are, That we have supreme confidence in and we have the methods in our culture, but we do not know that we can mould our mind into a happy, wise person. That sounds like mystical. And that's Buddha's expertise. So the concept of changing your mind, thoughts from not having any musical thoughts to having many musical thoughts and therefore playing the piano, that makes sense to us. But to have the idea that you can lessen anger and lessen attachment and lessen jealousy and lessen depression and grow wisdom and kindness and love and contentment, that sounds mystical to us. That sounds mystical. It's very fascinating. Why should it? We know we can control our minds. We know we can learn brilliant things mentally. But because we believe emotions somehow are something different. We believe they're set in stone. This is just the way I am. I'm just born this way. But what, what, So the, the, one of the key approaches in the Buddhist approach is to start to listen to the conceptual stories. And this is the point. Because what a pretty cup is, is a conceptual story. It's a viewpoint. Eye consciousness, she's shape and color, you know. You hear a sound, but you might get angry with the sound because it's, it's what you don't, it's a sound you don't like. But, you know, you're, you're labeling it a certain thing. You've got a viewpoint in the mind about that sound. We have a viewpoint in the mind about that mind. And the reality is that's how we live our life every second of the day. We're responding with our mental consciousness every second, interpreting things we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Human beings, whatever it is, that's it. So the, the, the senses are this limited, powerful, limited, though, capacity for cognition, but are, that are the doorway to everything we experience. And then our mental consciousness, you know, is where all the stories are. So in a millionth of a second, quicker than Google, when that, my eyes go there, up out of my mouth will come the words, what a pretty cup. Well, that's a concept, isn't it? It's a viewpoint. One plus two, one plus one is two is a concept. What a pretty cup is a concept. They're both thoughts. But we think of the intellectual ones up here, all rational and intelligent, and, and the other ones are down here. And we don't, but we think we don't see any relationship between emotions, anger or love, and thoughts. But this is the point in Buddhism. They're rooted in being. They're underpinned by and driven and dri and driven by, underpinned by, driven by being uh, uh, thoughts, thoughts, concepts. Look at anger. How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. You know, or jealousy. Look at the pain. Feel the pain. But this is the problem, the biggest problem. This is where the Buddhist techniques can come in. This is the thing, you know, that we can learn. Just recently now on Instagram, people ask me the questions. And it's like it's like mystical to us. How, people ask him, how can you learn to hear your thoughts before they become emotional? Well, that's the job. But it's a surprise to us. It's like, it's like surprising to us because we so fixate on emotions and feelings. And so the problem with feelings and emotions um, is that we don't, this is the point, we don't notice them until the body feels them, until, they, until we experience them in the body. And that's the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. It's like way too late to wait till then. And that's why it's so difficult to think that you can change your mind, that you can change anger. Because when we experience it, when, you're, you're, when your heart is shaking and the tears are coming out your, at your eyes and the mouth is yelling words, and to, he, to, hear, to hear that you can change your mind and learn not to be angry sounds a like complete mystical nonsense to us. Because it's emotional, so intense. But to hear that, it's that emotion is the tip of the iceberg and that's driven deep, deep down that from, um, from incredible habit. We've programmed ourselves. We've perfected the thoughts of anger to the point where it's just become spontaneous. So you could say, forget about the advanced levels to which we can develop our minds, according to Buddha, you know, forget those. Just to learn to know it's possible to slowly, slowly become familiar with the conceptual stories, even at the grossest level, that inform our emotions. That's the key. 
When we can learn that, we can learn to be in charge of our mind and life, you know. And it doesn't happen overnight. So let's look at how is anger in, uh, conceptual. It sounds like a joke. How is anger conceptual? It's not, it's really not complicated. I mean, you know, let's say one of you doesn't, let's say Sonny doesn't ever express anger. As I say, Sonny never opens her mouth about anger. Let's say Sonny has impeccable behavior, only says nice words. Let's just say, some people are like that. Now, but if, let's say she knows her mind and she can, or she hears all these crazy thoughts. I remember a person I talked to who wasn't a Buddhist or anything we were discussing. And he said, he was like that. He has perfect behavior, but he says he never stops hearing his crazy thoughts. But they never come out of his mouth. But his, his mind is uncontrolled, you know, he said. He said he could see that. So what does it mean, mind uncontrolled? It means un cut, cut for thoughts. I mean, the Buddhist, modern psychology says there's like a thousand thoughts a second. Buddha would absolutely agree. And they're there nonstop. We know that from the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep and throughout the night in our dreams. We know they're never stopping, ever. But we don't pay, we don't notice them because we don't pay attention until they're emotional until your body's shaking. You don't know that you're depressed until you, you're inert in bed. You don't know you're angry until the words are vomiting out your mouth. The commonest question we ask is, what, what do I do when I'm angry? Meaning when you're in the midst of screaming at your boyfriend, what am I going to do? That's like asking, what am I going to do on the freeway where I'm going 120 miles an hour and my wheels are falling off? Well, it's a little bit late to ask. If you'd learn to watch the wheels wobbling when you're going at 10 miles an hour and had decent maintenance, and I'm not being sarcastic or even funny, you would never have wheels falling off on the freeway at 120 miles an hour, ever. It's not possible. But we don't know we have mechanics. We don't know we have techniques. That's our trouble. I think even psychologically in our culture, we wait till it's emotional and unbearable before we dare to sneak off to a therapist with guilt, you know, or take a pill. In other words, we don't, have, and I'm not joking, we don't have maintenance for our mind. We don't, it's these days more and more, we are learning, more and more people are having meditation techniques, approaches to it, psychological approaches, therapy, blah, blah, brilliant. But we still, we wait until it's too late. I mean, you'd never do that with your car or your house or your garden. You, you maintain things. We have brilliant skills, you know. It sounds so simplistic to talk this way, but it's really true. So because we don't pay attention and we only notice the anger when your heart is shaking and the words are vomiting out your mouth. And of course it feels like impossible. How can I change that? It's impossible. Of course it sounds, it feels impossible. Of course it does. But once we understand even theoretically and learn to see the logic of it, that that, you know, in other words, okay, to finish, Sunny, the finished example of Sunny is one of those people who let's say doesn't say the words. She's controlled behavior. So if she knows she's got an angry thoughts and she wrote down all her angry thoughts. Now, another person who does express their angry thoughts, you just have to tape record them, you know, put your thingy button on and transcribe what they say. You've got two bits of paper, right? Here, this point. It's so simple. You have two bits of paper. And probably it could be that the thoughts in the quiet person's mind on the piece of paper are more violent. You hear my point here? Than the person who's shouting and yelling. Because, you know, the person who's got a quiet mind is thinking of killing all the time, thinking of shooting or murdering or hating people. Some people are like that, have very controlled behavior. So what is anger? Where's anger? Anger, one person's shouting and yelling, and we think that's anger. No, that's just your body. That's just the body screaming, and the mouth and the body shouting. The anger is in the mind. It's a conceptual story. The person who's got perfect behavior has it, but it's at the thoughts, the level of thoughts. So it's so evident, it's all thoughts. It's so clear, it's concepts. If you read that those two pieces of paper, you don't have to hear the people shouting to recognize immediately, like reading a script, you know? Oh my God, these people are angry, listen to them. You can imagine them shouting. That's conceptual stories. Every single word on a piece of paper is a concept. So it's obvious that anger, anger, love, depression, kindness, jealousy, forgiveness, you just have to read words in a book and you can say, oh, there's patience, there's kindness, there's anger, there's psychosis. It's not complicated. It's not complicated, really. It's clear it all is rooted in having conceptual stories, viewpoints, opinions deep in our, deep in our memory. So one of the interesting things about Buddhism, there's two things. 
we talked about the last few weeks was karma. One way, sort of like one way the mind works in Buddhism for, for Buddha is that everything we think and do and say programs us um, in those habits, you know, this kind of qualitative way the mind works and then brings results. The other way is that it's bare bones. There's they, In the Buddhist view, there's nothing we've ever seen, heard, tasted, touched or smelt that goes astray, everything automatically that we have cognized at any level is imprinted, is, is stored in our memory. Just it's stored there, you know? That's how come I can even remember there's a pretty cup. It's just stored as a memory, good or bad, doesn't matter. So our mind is, I mean, the Buddha, and the Buddha indeed would say our mind goes back and back and back and back before this life. Can you imagine the number of memories that? So the deal for the Buddha is, he has discovered, this is his view, that there are states of mind that are I-based. And don't feel guilty. This is how it is. That's how he describes. That it, because, and, they, and they're delusional. They're, they're these, this word they use a lot in Buddhist psychology, afflictions, disturbing emotions. And they're deeply habitual, deeply, deeply, primordially ancient inside us, and, and, a very, and very deeply emotional. Why? It's because they're habits. It's because they're habits. Then you have the positive ones. We all know the difference. We don't have to be a great thinker to see this. When you hear the word anger, depression, jealousy, you don't go, wow, how wonderful. I'd love to have that. We know they refer to horrible states of mind. We see it when you see other people experiencing them. We know they're horrible. It's not a question of judgment. It's clearly the person that's having a bad time, you know. They're painful, deeply painful. Torment us. They torment us. And then a person is more loving and kind and patient. You can see they're, part, they're light, spacious, joyful, easygoing, relaxed. It's sort of evident, you know. But they're all conceptual stories. So what's fascinating about the Buddhist analysis is that um, the, the so-called positive ones, the virtuous thoughts, the, the spacious ones, the ones such that when we have, when they predominate, we, in, in, I said ourselves, are feeling more fulfilled and easygoing and relaxed because that's their nature. That they are, they're valid states of mind. It's not a moralistic statement. They're valid, this is what's curious, insofar as they are to some degree in sync with reality. The Buddha will talk very much about emptiness, this ultimate view of emptiness, which I'm sure we'll go into. And the relative way that things exist is called dependent arising. Everything is interdependent. Things exist. Just the natural way the universe functions is that things work interdependently. So when we're in touch with interdependence, whether it's the physical world, the, the, the harmony, everything's harmonious. It's the harmony of the elements and the harmony of the weather and the harmony of people with each other. That's what everything works beautifully. It's just the way things are. When things are working well, they work interdependently. But the Buddha's view is when you have an Im in imbalance in the person's mind and there's a lot of anger or depression or jealousy or fears or anxiety, nothing works harmoniously. Everything's bumping into everything. There's nothing. So those states of mind are invalid insofar as they're not in sync with dependent arising. And the virtuous states of mind are in sync with dependent arising. They are valid, therefore they're reasonable, therefore they're appropriate, therefore they make you feel happier, therefore they help you help other people. You're more, you're more reasonable when they're, when they're functioning. The others are unreasonable because they're, they're, we live in la-la land when we live among, when they prevail. I think we can see this when we look into our lives. Don't hear it as moralistic or judgmental. This is analysis, the Buddha's view. And that's what's fascinating. It's not about the brain. It's not about, you know, the Buddhist view is it's very, very, very direct. It's dealing with the actual, actual subjective cognitive process itself. Your actual thoughts. You learn, not joking, you learn to become at a very sophisticated, clear, precise level, your own therapist. You learn to hear the thoughts ever more precisely, ever more clearly, and you can learn to unpack and unravel them well before they vomit out the mouth. You learn to be in charge, you know. 
I mean, what do you think mindfulness is all about? I mean, the essence, people don't talk about it being that way, but that's really what you're doing. If you're learning this technique to keep your mind focused on one thing moment by moment, which is what mindfulness means. And this is why also, as Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. It's not wholly in its nature, but it's a very necessary technique just keep yourself on track in what you're doing so you can get where you're going. If you lose if you lose the plot and forget where you're heading on the car or on the train, you'll, you'll be wandering off into la-la land. So being mindful is the ability to keep your mind on track, not forget what you're doing. You're making it a cake. You better know where you're at in making the cake. It's a very practical part of your mind. This is it. That's one of its functions is to help you, you know, learn to be in charge of what's going on in your head. Of course, it's immensely difficult because there are a thousand thoughts a second. We're not noticing them until they're shouting. That's the habit. And the degree to which we can plumb the depths of our mind is way more subtle than we can even imagine in our, in our culture. It's like we think it's mystical. It's not. It's just advanced, that's all. So the reason we want to pay attention to the thoughts the reason we want to become better and better and better at, at identifying what is happening in here before it gets to the level of emotion when we, lose, when we lose control is simply because we want to be happy and not suffer. Forget compassion yet. Forget other people. It's just for ourselves, you know. We're the beneficiaries of this. But it's the hardest job in the world because we're addicted to doing the exact opposite. So this is where it's interesting. All these thoughts in here the thousand a second, whether they're labeled angry thought, jealous thought, depressed thought, eye-based thought, this thought, loving thought, kind thought, whichever one it is, you have to learn to identify them. You have to learn to identify them. I mean, it's so sophisticated. It's extraordinary. So we've got to start somewhere. We've got to start somewhere. And that's why in typical approach in the Buddhist view of in the step-by-step -step approach to practice, the very first level of practice is not even about your mind yet. It's about controlling the servants of your mind, the body and speech. Yeah. It sounds so boring to think that spiritual practice. Oh, I want to meditate. Well, yeah, you can't much until you can't. If you can't, you can't if you can't control the words that vomit out your mouth every day, and if you can't, if you can't control your body, you jump on every piece of cake or every boy that you meet with your body, then how can you control the, the mind, which is what's running your body and speech? You've got to control the body and speech first. Of course, you do both together, but you've got to, you know, the, the body and speech are the grossest level. And this is an unusual way to put things. We don't think this way in our culture, but analyze it. It's very logical. Your body and speech, what they do is just doing what the mind is doing. We don't even know them. We don't even notice. We're surprised when those words come out of the mouth. Wow, where'd that come from? Because we're not paying attention. I mean, we should be embarrassed. <laughs> it's very fascinating. But why it's difficult is because the habit, the habit is strong. The and 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 this okay. What's interesting, you know, if a person doesn't have much anger, I mean, they sort of think things through and they say, "Oh, I won't get angry," you know. And that means their anger is not very strong. It means that there's not much emotion of anger there, which means they're able to hear the thoughts and analyze it and then make a decision. I won't get angry. I'd always be amazed by that when I first heard about that because I thought, no, it's not possible. Because I just, for me, anger was my, my second name. You know, I explode the moment I felt something, it exploded out my mouth. It was a little girl, you know. So to hear about a person who didn't have much anger, who said to themselves, uh, some people would say, I've decided not to be angry again, I'd be astonished. I thought, what are you talking about? Well, some people are like that. Some of you people in this room might be like that. You just don't have much anger, which means it's not a very deep habit. We've all got aversion. Aversion is the bare bones state of mind. We've all got that. But it mightn't be very volatile. <coughs> well, how marvelous, you know, how fantastic. But the trouble is because they're so strong, these habits are so strong, and that when they're at the level of emotion, it's this is the this is the this is the tragedy for us. It, what we're when you're experiencing that anger or that jealousy or that hurt or that anxiety, let's look at anxiety. Whatever that story is conceptually, and there is a conceptual story that, although it's quite subtle, 
and it's very habitual and deep and primordial and, and have so habitual you can't hear it as a story all you can feel is the body you know tight anxious whatever physical experience it's really hard to even believe that it comes down to being elaborate conceptual stories going on in your mind that you've been practicing for so long to the point where now it's habitual and it's physical all the emotions are like that we don't notice them until we notice the at the physical level and that's just the symptom of them of those conceptual stories in there so we've got to dig deep and give dig down you know and it just takes time so that the, so that what's interesting here is you know that the, the approach we tend to have in our culture is when you have a problem like your anger whether you're talking to your friend or your therapist what we tend to do is describe the event. We describe the person. We describe what they did, what they said, what happened. We don't actually even know how to describe or get in touch with the anger itself. This almost seems mystical to us. If you think of attachment, for example, there's the simplest level, attachment to some chocolate cake, for example, which is... All, the function of all the delusions, as we refer to the neurotic ones, the delusions, delusional, they're delusional insofar as they are conceptual stories, but they are distorted, they exaggerate, they embellish. So attachment over-exaggerates, embellishes the deliciousness of the object, cake, person, mug, whatever. Aversion, the bare bones state of mind beneath anger exaggerates embellishes the ugly aspects of something somebody the person the, whatever it is you know and this attachment and anger simplest simplest words these are the fundamental in every person's mind and the other and all the other delusions are stem stem from these this is not how we think in our culture you know? it's been so simple so uh, the trouble is because they're so habitual. You know, you don't, I mean, okay, the Buddhist view of karma is we wake up in this life at the time of conception. We enter our mother's egg and sperm at the time of conception already programmed with our own past habits. I mean, this is interesting to even factor in because the Western one is we, we wake up in this life, you know, um, uh, programmed with our mother and father's habits, not for the Buddha, no. We share them, but they did not give them to us. This is a massive point in the Buddhist view. You bring your own with you. And already they're habitual. Already since they're tiny, they're tiny since you're a kid, you know. These conceptual stories go to an incredibly subtle level. And the more we've practiced them, the more easy we fall into the trap. You know, my mother didn't have to teach me to be angry. I knew from the time I can remember how to be angry. It was a well-practiced habit, I can tell you. Where'd I come from? Not her, not my father. I brought it with me. This is the idea. So when it's habitual and when it's painful, like anger or anxiety or jealousy, then everything, this is the thing, because they're misconceptions, they're deeply, these, these emotional component of them, the physical part is they're embedded, they're underpinned by the conceptual story. It's very habitual. Because it's so habitual, things even appear that way to us, and that's the killer. As I was open, it's bad enough that the cake appears to us to be more delicious than it really is. And that's what attachment causes. Bad enough that that person appears more divine than they really are, which is how your attachment perceives them because of the habit of attachment. The bad enough they appear more delicious than they really are, or bad enough that that person appears so ugly to you. But the worst part is we believe the story is truth. That's the killer. Because they're so habitual, and we believe the story. So look how most of us suffer terribly, our uncontrolled, unstopping thoughts, our negative, unhappy thoughts sometimes about ourselves, let's say, about whatever. There's never a second, a millisecond where we think, what a silly thought. I'm not as bad as that, Rabina. Don't believe a word of it. We, know we believe it totally. We believe totally whatever thoughts we have. And usually the negative ones. It's so ironic. It's so shocking that we should. But and it and it's in, in and we know when you're miserable, 
when things are going wrong and you're depressed or you're anxious or you're worried or whatever, or feeling hopeless or self-loathing because things have gone wrong, 27 people can tell you your good qualities, can say it's not as bad as you think, Rubina. We don't believe a word of it. But that one person says one bad word about you. We believe it. We are magnetized by it. And it's the absolute truth. So it shows that they're already the thoughts I have about myself, you know. Those 27 people who say nice things about me, we just don't believe it. We'd love to we want to hear those words, but we don't believe them. This is the worst part. This is the killer. Bad enough things, myself, the cake, the person, appear wrongly to us through the lenses of these delusions. Bad enough. But the worst part is we believe they're true. And that's what makes it so difficult to change. This is the irony of ego, you know. So one of the most powerful practices when things go wrong and you're freaking out and the boyfriend has left you or the job just got sacked or all the painful things that happen in daily life it can be mild, painful, intense, painful. Thoughts uncontrolled. You know, all the positive thoughts are in there. But the, I always think of, I think of them as my roommates. And it always seems to be when the mind is running rampant, it's the negative roommates that are running the show. You know, they're the loudest voices. They seem to dominate. And the good roommates, like intelligence, self-respect, kindness, self-compassion, whatever words you want, they're all there, but we can't hear them. They're like hiding under the wardrobe. or in, They're hiding in the wardrobe and under the bed. So you've got to consciously bring them out, consciously say positive thoughts. I mean, it sounds hilarious, you know, like Pollyanna. But this is one of the most powerful practices. And then to not believe, have a tiny part of your wisdom, believe, thinking, yeah, my, my mind's uncontrolled, I'm freaking out, things look terrible, it's a disaster, I can't handle. Part of you, your wisdom is saying, it's all right, Rabina. Things appear like this, but don't believe it. There is a truth there, but the delusions exaggerate them. This is the tragedy. Mm -hmm. But the most powerful one for me is that I know when I first heard the teachings and started to think about it, blah, 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 is that it's, it's, very, it's kind of encouraging. It gives us confidence to know that we're not set in stone. We know that. Our, our mother's teaches these wonderful things. We're not set in stone. And that's such a powerful statement. You can't believe it. Everything is not set in stone. I am not set in stone. But we believe it when things go wrong. You know? So interesting. I'm not set in stone. I can mould my mind. So even when you're being chaotic, when it's like you're being, when things are a disaster, to having that confidence, that courage, that optimism, that sustains you. That sustains us. We have to have that. We have to have that confidence, you know, that our mind is this amazing thing that we can learn to become utterly familiar with so that we can unpack and unravel and deconstruct these incredible layers and layers of conceptual stories, you know. And begin to make sense of them and then change them because it's my mind it's my mind you know this is the essence of being a buddhist actually day to day i tell you this is the job so ask me some questions please sunny i need oh i've got a tissue it's an old one i oh, know it's a new one look at this i can blow my nose in peace mm -hmm. i always talk about how um when i was in san
Venerable, we cannot hear you. Oh, no, I was just took it off to blow my nose and I forgot. Oh, that. thank you. <laughs> um, it's Kimberly. I miss you. I want to know what happened to your arm, darling. Oh, I, I, oh yeah, it's a big scratch. It looks very dramatic. Yes. I bumped something. Well, please look I'll, after it. I, I will. I promise. Okay, thank you. I love you. Uh, I, good. So I have that question. <laughs> Ask me some questions, people. Or bring up conversation. Say whatever you want. Come on. Talk to me. <laughs> Nothing? Oh, I'll drink some water. No questions. I have a question. Does, Where are you? Does sensory, sensory con consciousness lead to dependent originations? Lee, what a curious question. You have to unpack that question. No, the answer is no, but why don't you say what you mean by that? Okay, well, the sensory consciousness is, as you say, like a dumb animal. They're limited in their capacity for cognition. Right. We think you see a divine cup, you just see shape and color, right. and then, then the thoughts describe it. Right. So the question is, therefore. Yeah, so sensory consciousness leads to the conversation about the planet origin. No, no, not at all. Because essentially you're labeling the cup. Oh, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, of course, it, yeah, clearly it would, because when you realize you're just seeing shape and color, the rest from that millisecond is your opinion. Right. It's all opinions. Or is it your past karma that's causing you? Also that, too, that all, well, I mean, that's just one of the things that's factored in. The way you interpret things is very much due to your habits. So, you know, of course. Of course, you've got, we've got certain habits. So if you love the shape of, you know, love the shape of, you know, one-legged girls, let's say, you've got some habits. Every time you see one-legged girl, you're all excited. That's just, that's karma. Yeah, for sure. Or you like, I mean, whatever it is we have attraction to, since we're little, we don't just get those from our parents. So we are informed by what de what determines our habits is absolutely is what we bring with us. But the way we interpret them now, which is informed by that, but is also its own function. Do you understand? Yeah, yes. This may sound really stupid. It's like, you be stupid, darling. It's all right. So we see the cup... We know it's a cup, and then we put our, our thoughts into that. Yeah. That's a nice cup. Um, so does a dog see that and think it's a cup, and he just thinks it's a cup? Yeah, so that's, the, 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 the animal's minds are the same, exactly the same. That They also do to their habit. So the karma, you come into this world with habits, certain tendencies, and then you respond to them based upon that you know so animals are just the same but however they i mean they're not going to have no they haven't got the clever conceptuality that we've got but they certainly develop the habit they're going to recognize food from the time they're born they're going to recognize mummy's titty you know no one has to say to them there's titty go to it that the karma is that strong so what they don't have clever concepts like we've got but their minds are driven by concepts for sure same thing and whatever that so however that appears i mean so you know um yeah i mean they won't a, a squirrel won't see an acorn it'll see breakfast but, but yeah so they're driven by habit just like we are and that's conceptual but at a very gross level and mainly instinctive there's very you don't learn much new you know what we say what do we say a leopard can't change its spots but they're very much driven by concepts same as we are but limited in their ability to develop new ones or get rid of those ones Jonathan yeah what else do you want? yes Sunny go go yeah, good. Um, good. Uh, talk to me. Yes. Um, if we reach a clarity of mind, like clear light mind, or we have advanced our mind a great deal through practice, well, forget about clear light. Why advanced? Keep it simple, Mary. Right. Okay. But at, and at some point, do we lose our memories, or our memories? No, no, never, never. They're always there. No, never, 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 never. Your mind, as long as it exists, will have. Because when you're fully developed, this is where it sounds cosmic to us you see it you 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 have you retain memory i mean right now we can't remember even 99 percent of today forget about a past life what a joke but when you've cut all the conceptual level of mind which is very gross and you've accessed your more subtle level you've got shabata you realize emptiness and all this you have massive memory you can see infinite past and infinite future and see the minds of others as well that's one of your ways of helping others but you don't then form concepts based on your memory or your past karma or whatever. You don't do that because now you're not reacting that way anymore. You Okay. 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 Let's say you become a bodhisattva. Let's say you realize emptiness. And from some certain point, you don't need to be reborn. You don't need to have gross bodies and have the usual experiences because you're now in charge. But out of your compassion, you will manifest in a body 
Do you understand? And you'll act like a normal human being, but you're not buying into any of it. You're not sort of up and down like a yo-yo believing this is good and this is bad, but you'll mm -hmm. still have concepts because you need to function to talk to people. But you, you, okay. you, you have wisdom. You're not sort of sucked into the concepts. You don't believe the nonsense. Okay. I do you understand? Yeah, yes, okay. I do. Thank you. Okay. okay. Who else? Yes and yes. Go on. Do, do the old texts, the medieval ones, do they talk about happiness particularly? Or because that just feels to me like kind of a modern kind of no, no, oh no, this is very interesting. No, it's a very interesting question. This is what's fascinating. The four noble truths, Buddha's first teaching, right? 2,500 years ago, and he came along and he gave his first teaching. And it's called the Four Noble Truths, and it's all about suffering. So the first one is there is suffering. The second is you can, there are causes. The third is you can be free of suffering and its causes. And the fourth is how to do it. Well, flip that over. That's a method of how to get happy. So this is the point that if you put it very bluntly, what Buddha's saying is, okay, okay, no, okay. One of the fundamental points that Buddha takes is if, if you analyze it and observe yourself and others, everybody wants to be happy and nobody wants to suffer. So there are clearly Buddha goes into different levels of suffering and happiness. But even if we take the ordinary one, the, the simplest level that happiness is what you get when nice things happen, isn't it? The weather's pleasing, the senses are satisfied, the person smiles, the ordinary level of happiness, because we because we believe the cake is the cause of it and you believe your girlfriend is the cause of it, that's why we then have attachment to them. And so as long as we keep getting what our attachment wants and we get happy feelings, and that's happiness. Nothing wrong with the simplest level of happiness, okay? But the Buddha's saying, very simply, it's unstable. Because, because it's driven by attachment, this emotional hunger. Because, you know, your girlfriend was kind to you one time. So you think, oh, she's got to be kind to me again. Then you're going to smile again. And then she must be kind to you again. Then you'll be smiling again. Because we believe the girlfriend's smile, the girlfriend's good behavior and the chocolate cake, they're the cause of happiness, we think. Do you get my point here? Mm -hmm. So that's why we keep clinging to those events to have them happen again. All the Buddha's saying is, no, no, no. What causes your happiness finally, when you're really together in this practice, what is the cause of your happiness is the absence in your mind of attachment, anger, anxiety, jealousy, depression. So that's the, the first level of practice in Buddhism is to get rid of the causes of suffering. That just naturally brings a state of well-being and happiness. So that the state of the absence of suffering is... Would be the, the presence of happiness. And a, a level of, and the Buddha is saying, a level of happiness that, with respect, it sounds like cosmic. Like, so basically, basically, happy feelings, unhappy feelings, nothing wrong with those. They're not like good or bad. It's just we all want happy feelings. We don't want unhappy feelings. And all he's saying is you guys are up the, up the creek without a paddle. You think cakes and lovely girlfriends are the cause of the happy feelings. He's saying you're not wrong when you, when that, when you, when you see that cake and it, when you taste it, it definitely does trigger a happy feeling. He says it does. But a subtle level of suffering is, but haven't you realized, sweetheart, that if you keep eating cake, waiting for more happiness to come, we all know that more happiness won't come. Vomiting will come. You agree with that? If you keep eating cake, you'll eventually vomit. And I'm not being gross here, but I am being gross. If you keep having that contact with that girlfriend, you'll die of exhaustion. You need a good sleep and to be all hungry again next day. So we keep believing, this is what he means by samsara and attachment. It drives, this, it's a belief that I'm nothing inside and I've got to have the cake and the girlfriend. And it's not moralistic, it's just practical. He says that does trigger happy feelings, but he says they're, un, they're so limited because they don't last. So he's saying, oh, I've found a method. He's telling us simply that I've found a method of how to have happy feelings that do last. And in fact, when you have achieved what they mean by nirvana, and it's not some place, it's the state of your own mind to the degree that you've given up attachment and aversion and all the rubbish. And what you're left with is just a completely joyful mind. I mean, it sounds so ridiculous, but that's the Buddha's method to get happiness, is to give up the delusions, give up the neuroses, which cause suffering, and then give up harming others, which we do on the basis of those things, because that then ripens as future suffering, so that you can learn to find in yourself your own joyful now. So mind in Buddhism, when it's unencumbered by the delusions, is what a happy mind is. That's what happiness is. And to levels of joy that we can't, it sounds like ridiculous. Do you understand? That's the essence of the Buddha's view, really. So basically what he's saying is you people think that happy feelings are what you get when you get the cake or the girlfriend. And he's saying not wrong, but it doesn't last. And we all know that. He says, no, no, no. You're up the creek without a paddle or you're up a something, whatever it is. And he says, no, happy feelings, happiness is what you're left with 
when you give up delusions, when you give up attachment and anger and the rubbish. Do you understand? It's literally, it's like almost sounds like passive. The way to get happy at this first level is to give up the rubbish. But of course, it's the hardest job on the planet because we're completely addicted to them all. Do you understand? So happiness is the point. This is just the first part. And then you add compassion to the mix where you have, and then now you try to help other people get happy. That's the compassion wing. A bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. Do you understand? So the essence of what Buddha is saying in the wisdom wing, we've all got the potential to be joyful. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. You understand? And the method is to get rid of the delusions in your mind. That's as simple as that. But it's the hardest job we'll ever do because we don't believe it. Because we believe the happiness comes from the cake and the, and the suffering comes from the mean girlfriend. Do you understand? Are we communicating here? Good. <laughs> it's a really very practical, but just kind of like, you know, difficult job. Yes, who else? Yes, you, go. Um, so in, in therapy, a lot of times, in order to, in, like what you're saying, exaggerating yeah. attraction, yeah. exaggerating aversion, yeah. in therapy, a lot of times, you know, people will go back to the past. Yes, and that's right. Trauma. Yes, and that's, that's right. Is that does that apply? No, that's what that what is that's what's totally utterly fascinating to me. The Buddhist approach, when you study the okay, when you study the mind, if you want to study the Buddhist model of the mind seriously, and will take you several years because it's really fascinating, both the epistemological model and the psychological model. It's not about doing therapy; it's highly technical because you're learning about the complexity of all these different states of mind and how they function. Do you understand? And so. And then you learn slowly through your own practice to identify the attachment and identify the anger, identify the jealousy. There's no discussion of the things that cause it because the Buddha's view is what causes your attachment is the habit of attachment. What causes you anger is the habit of anger. Yes, the person out there triggered it, but that's what we focus on in the West. Now, there's nothing wrong with going back into the past. It can help you, you know, like it can help you. It can, by remembering events, it can help you learn about your own mind. But usually the way we put it is by remembering what my daddy did to me, that's why I'm angry. The Buddha says, no, no, you're angry because you've got a habit to be angry. So to do the Buddhist job, you don't need to look into the past. You just learn to know your own mind now and you see your habits. And then you can look back in your life and see where daddy did this and daddy did that. Now you know why you responded in a certain way. It's about your mind. It's very fascinating. Do you understand me or not? So, that, But it's really powerful. And that word trauma is a very fascinating one because that's a lot, lot talked lately. So let's, okay, maybe this, we'll do that. We'll carry on next time as well. But certainly the one of um, trauma, this is really explained in the Buddhist analysis of what attachment and aversion are. These seemingly simple words, but they have a profound um, role in our lives from the Buddhist perspective. So basically attachment is this junkiness that feels bereft and nothing and is therefore frantic for something out there such that when I get contact with it, I'll, I'll fill myself up. So it's like attachment's a symptom of, a, of an isolated, desolate person, a person who has no life, who feels like they are nothing. It's my way of putting it, okay? Who doesn't talk like this? And attachment is this emotional hunger, therefore this hankering after something out there such that when I get it, it'll fill me up and bring me some contentment. That's the, that's the, the level, of, that's what attachment is. So it's this massive expectation and it's happening every millisecond of the day and it's just primordially deep since we're born. So let's say you're going floating along with this, you're born with a certain level of this attachment, this emotional hunger, and then mean thing, daddy does mean things to you. Well, naturally, what happens when your attachment doesn't get what it wants, which is this affirmation, which is people being nice to you, which is the pleasant taste and all the lovely things, when you get the opposite, that is what triggers the arising of the opposite of attachment, which is aversion. So attachment, you go towards the thing. Aversion is like the shock, you push it away. Now, depending on your personality, if you're a very quiet person, and you don't express anger, which is the volatile level of aversion, when daddy did those naughty things to you, what you, you won't shout and yell and punch daddy. You'll just push it away. But aversion has arisen. Aversion wants, doesn't want to look at it. So that's what we build. That's what trauma is, is the buildup of the habit of pushing away because we're unable to deal with it at the time. 
the bad things. So then, but it, it, it can never go astray. It's all there in your memory. That's why it's got to come out at some point, anyway, anyhow, at some point, you know, it'll going to come out and you'll not be able to, we can't suppress it in other words. Do you understand what I'm saying? So trauma is the degree to which you haven't dealt with, and most of us haven't. With even the, I mean, even just the tiny events in our daily life. Forget about people being mean to us, but it's the baby events of attachment being thwarted. When you break your truck, when you hurt your toe, attachment only wants to have happy feelings every second. It's a junkie. For the, do you get my point here? So the millisecond it doesn't get what it wants, aversion arises, which is like a little panic attack. So when it's the serious things depending on your personality, it'll either be screaming, yelling, shout and punch and you go mad or you suppress. So th that's really what, I mean, it's a way of putting what, I'm not trying to simpl simplify it. Undealt with stuff. And we've all got undealt with stuff because we haven't known how to deal with things. Do you understand? So there's masses of work we all need to do. That's why people, when they go and do retreat using the Buddhist techniques, you, you, it'd be, the vomit just comes up and out so powerfully, you know, because you, you, you work when you're working on your mind, on the actual, you're learning to concentrate, you're doing all this work in your mind itself, it, it's it's attracting the dirt to come out, you know, attracting the vomit to come up, like if you go to therapy, it's the same, do you understand? But you don't deal, you can, but you, and it's not my method, I've never, I mean, I remember things that would happen, of course I know my, my childhood and what daddy did and mummy did and the Catholic nuns or whatever, whatever, but for me, the main methodology of the Buddhist one, which I like, is dealing with what is that arising in my mind, what is, is that attachment, is that anxiety, is it jealousy, is it anger, what's it saying, you know? personifying these states of mind, hearing their conceptual story, and then arguing with them. Do you understand? Does it make sense? Dealing with the present, as in things as they arise in the present. Yeah, I mean, you're dealing with the present. Exactly. You're dealing with the present. You don't have to look into the past. But then you remember, if you remember, then you can remember the past. But you, so if I think of my father, my daddy wasn't the best daddy in the world, but I love my father. It's okay. Just using an example. You know, I, I didn't suppress. I mean, some of my sisters suppressed, for example. Don't have any memory. I didn't, because my style was to be angry and to fight and yell and shout back. I didn't just sit there like, you know, I didn't sit there and just take it. I didn't suppress. So I remember. But it's, um, what I'm saying is, for me now, seeing my mind now, by knowing my mind now, helps me understand how I was then. And therefore helps me see how I dealt with those things then. So it's just a, it's a different approach, you know. I don't know. Are we communicating? Are we communicating? Yeah, what else? Who's there? May we... Eileen, hello, sweetheart. Talk to me. Unmute pedal. I was going to ask a question about sensory consciousness, but what, okay, you, but what you just explained about trauma was really uh, amazing. In, in any event, uh, different okay. responses. In any okay. event, uh, I just want to reiterate that, that our sensory consciousness is is wired through the mind even though it feels very physical the elements you know uh, well yeah absolutely by definition for buddha consciousness is the part of i'll spell it out i consciousness is that part of your mind which is not physical that functions through the medium of the eyeball and the nerves all working nicely so if you didn't have eye consciousness you wouldn't have a, a cognition of shape and color so there's a so that was there's this extra component in Buddhism that's called the non-physical part of you, which is your mind, which is not the way we talk in the modern world. It's your conscious eye consciousness, ear consciousness, taste consciousness. Yes. They're parts of your mind that function through the medium of the physical to have those various cognitions of taste, color, shape, sound. So, so the memory then that we, when we come into this life and we are drawn to certain things on a sensory level, have to do with the karmic imprints in the yeah, mind. Yeah, but really, that what? Okay, this interesting point. You could argue. Yeah, like you know, if you're attached to chocolate cake, someone hates carrots. You know, I mean that that can be an imprint. Yeah, literally, quite a simple one of an imprint of a habit from the past lives even since a tiny child you might have that habit or yes but so but the sensory one is just it's the mental one that's the real point the sensory one is bare bones there's just shape and color there there's not you know but the mental consciousness gives carrot a certain there's a memory of carrot of being something that made you vomit maybe so you you don't when you see that orange shape and color Mm -hmm. it's eye consciousness just sees the shape and color but it's your mental consciousness that calls it carrot and doesn't like it 
Or like I always use the example of a little boy. This is how it works. If you look at the 12 links of dependent arising, it's very fascinating. This way Buddha analyzes the steps by which we live out our lives. It's very fascinating, one approach. So, you know, for example, I'll use that example of a little boy who was a fisherman since he was tiny. His mother said since he was very small, he loved fishing. So we just go, oh, that's just natural. Kids like fishing, but no. So what happens is this, due to past karmic habit of killing, there he is born as a human being, which is the karma of being of not killing, but that's one karma, there's many karmas. So he's born as a human, and then he go, someone takes him fishing. He hadn't thought of fishing until he met fishing. So the millisecond his eye consciousness lay, or he his eye consciousness saw that shape and color, instantaneously it, you know, you could say it or the, saw the scenario that was recognized as fishing, it triggered his past habit of having killed. And then to the degree that was a habit equaled then the next millisecond, the degree to which he experienced pleasure. And, and then the next millisecond attachment kicked in and painted a divine picture of fishing. So because the fishing attract, he was instantly attracted to fishing because he's got the habit to kill. So then it appeared delicious to him. So of course he would continue to fish because it triggered a pleasant feeling. But that's because it was a habit. Another yeah. child will see fishing will burst into tears and cry with compassion because their habit wasn't to kill. It was they had another habit. So depending on your habits, we come into this life, Eileen, program from the first second of conception with all of our tendencies. You know, mm -hmm. we don't get them from mummy and daddy. We bring them with us. And we just play them out. So then how we respond now is very much dependent on that. A person, I mean, you know, I think of like certain kids who are good at music or whatever it might be, good at killing. And this little boy was good at killing fish, you know, since he's three years old. Another kid, he is music, totally attracted to it and becomes a brilliant musician because the habit is so strong. And then you respond based on that habit, you respond in a certain way and you get attached to it. Some person has an aversion to it because it's not their habit. And some person has attachment to it because it's their habit. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, very much. And the so. senses are just the doorway, aren't they? They're just the intermediate between mm. us and others. We're so gross. We need, we don't have clairvoyance. We don't have access to our subtle mind. We're not clairvoyant. We can't see the minds of others. All we can do is see the body and indicate mm. maybe she's happy or sad because there are tears coming or there's a smile and her teeth are showing. You understand? We're very gross, really. Mm. Do you understand? We rely upon the sensory experience. We rely upon what appears to be happening in the person's body for us to deduce what they're going on in their mind, but often we haven't got a clue, isn't it? True. As we get more advanced, we have this direct access to other people's minds. We can see exactly what they're thinking and feeling. That's what clairvoyance is, and that's a natural quality that they talk about from 3,000 years ago that we can cultivate as we progress spiritually. Are we communicating? Yes, thank you, Rabina. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Go. No, the senses are fine. It's the mental, it's the it's the interpretation of what our senses tell us. You see, we give power to our senses. Because you know, if you know, for example, I mean, it's like let's say you're attached to chocolate cake normally, but now you've got a fever today, and you look at the cake, it looks repulsive to you. So it's not just senses that are really having a problem. The senses are seeing the same shape and color as yesterday, but because other physical conditions are causing you to have a fever and your poor mind's distressed, the thought of eating it would make you vomit. Or even just after five pieces of chocolate cake, the cake makes you want to vomit. Whereas five pieces before, it looked delicious. So your senses aren't the problem. It's that it, every millisecond, it's our, suck, it's our conceptual interpretation. Every millisecond. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what not got to be trusted. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. So really the work to be done is quite intense. Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about the role of attachment and yeah. uh, suffering. Yeah. And then you mentioned aversion and yeah. trauma. What's yeah. the role of aversion? Like well, aversion, okay, let me just, yes, it's interesting. The, the way Buddha talks, he talks about the three poisons, this cute phrase, you know, the three poisons, the three toxic emotions. And they're really the basis of all the other dramas in the mind, according to Buddha's analysis. So the first one, the root one, the root delusion, the root neurosis is very subtle. And it's this primordial 
primordially deep misconception deep in the bones of our being of being a separate, lonely, bereft, cut off, concrete me. So there's the basis. So forget that one. On the basis of that, we have attachment to get what that fantasy I wants, which is the primordial one, which is this emotional hunger every second, every second. And it's an assumption that I must only get the nice things. It, the, 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 the strength of that attachment equals the strength of the trauma because the more hungry we are to have only nice things, nice smell, nice taste, pleasant words from mummy, pleasant words from daddy, every second since we're born, it's, it's spontaneous and it only wants nice things. Is emotional hunger. So the degree to which you don't get that equals the degree of your aversion. Then depending on your habits, it could be very quiet aversion. You're a very patient person and you don't have much aversion, which means you wouldn't have much trauma. Do you understand? It's just not that traumatic for you because you, your aversion isn't so intense. But depend, if you have a very strong aversion, but not expressed volatilely because you're a lot of fear, you understand? Then it's intense experience. Aversion is sees the thing as horrible. So it's when it's unbearable and you don't know how to deal with it, that's when you do the suppressing. That's when it becomes trauma. Because And even just the memory of something. And that's why, you, or even just seeing something that triggers a memory of it, like you're bitten by a dog or something. Just a memory. You don't remember it, but it triggers something in you. It's because you didn't deal with it at the time. So aversion, aversion is, oh my God, go away. Attachment is hungrily wanting. Aversion is pushing away. Do you understand? Yeah. Which is reasonable. If some punches you in the nose, you don't want, nobody wants that. But it's all to do with your attachment and your aversion. So it's huge, depending on the... So, so sometimes if the aversion is very quiet, not very strong, you won't have much trauma. But if it's strong but quiet, then it'll all get suppressed. And it'll be very, it'll be very hidden, have a lot of fear. Everywhere you turn, you know. But, is it, but maybe you're a very angry, volatile type person. So I saw as a kid, for me, I was always volatile, I'd shout and yell, I would threaten, you know, I'd scream at my father, I'd, you know, whatever. I, I was, I was very violent, and in a way, I didn't suppress. So maybe it wasn't so traumatic. I don't ever talk about, think about the word trauma, you know. Well, probably other people got trauma because of me, perhaps the other way. And you understand? <laughs> so I, yeah, are we, are we communicating? So tapped on aversion. It sounds so boring, but these are the fundamentals we go between these a thousand times a day. Every second one only nice experience. Even if you just stub your toe, that response, we think it's the, the hurt toe. No, it's aversion to it that really is the powerful. And this is a revelation. The body, the stub toe is one thing. But the aversion to it, the anger, how dare that happen? That's the part that really is the source of the pain, the source of the suffering. So then that's why we, when we start to realize that the pain in the knee is one thing, but aversion to it, not wanting it, wishing it wasn't there, how dare it be there? We've got to separate these. Then that's the one we can start to change. Because if I can't change the pain in my knee, I can change my aversion to it. And then the suffering is a lot less. This is what's powerful. Do you understand? Good. Huh? What? I don't know if I can do it. No, of course you can. We all can, slowly, slowly, one step at a time. But that's the revelation to discover that we say, well, of course I'm angry. I just hurt my knee. We'll say that. You understand? It's not true at all. It is now because we're just habitual, because attachment can't stand having problems. Aversion is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants, and attachment only wants nice feeling. So, depending on your habit, you scream and yell when your knee gets hurt. I mean, this is just, and this is a thousand times a day, people, ordinary. But our trouble is, you know, like if you went to your therapist, well, I got annoyed today because annoyance is just a quiet level of aversion. I should tell you, shut up and go home, whether you want to kill your husband before you come back. Do you understand? <laughs> we have to have it to be traumatic before we deal with it, you know? I'm, I'm joking a little bit. But if we can deal with the baby ones first, then when your hubby leaves you, you're ready for it. Do you understand? It's really just very logical. Deal with the baby events. You get annoyed when you're not getting what you want. Hubby slurps his tea. The traffic's too difficult. The red light. Baby things. We've got to learn to deal with baby things. So the way to deal with aversion at the simplest level is to greet the problem. And the really advanced one is to label it differently. We all know you can see everything as a challenge. We, all, we understand that. So labeling it differently completely changes it. And that's why I always use the example of my friends in prison who can't unlock the door. So they've got the choice to go mad or change their mind. And they change their mind so they don't go crazy. 
we can start with the baby events. When you stub your toe or the person doesn't say what you want them to say when you want it to be said. I mean, we're really very fragile. We're very, very fragile little needy little girls and boys. You know, want to be stroked and loved and get what we want every second. I'm not being mean about it. It's called suffering. You understand? Good. Three people up here. Eileen Merritt and who's the Google Pixel? Google 6 Pro. Sweetie Pie, what's your name? Talk to me. Who are you? What's your, what's your, you're not Google Pro 6. Who are you? Hello, my name is Dalton. Who, darling? Dalton. 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 D-A-L-T-O-N. I don't know why it says my phone title, but. Don't worry. Dalton. D-A-L-T-O-N. Yes. Okay, Dalton, talk to me. Uh, so I really like the way that you explained like attachment, uh, mm -hmm. but they're attachment and aversion, right? So if we're paying attention to our thoughts and we're noticing these attachments and these aversions, if it's an attachment, we should be trying to counterbalance that. And if it's That's aversion, it. we should be trying yeah. to counterbalance that. So attachment, okay. yeah, when the mind. So using a simple example of just like, you know, a simple example of attachment to some delicious food. The food might be delicious, but if you grab, you, you see the attachment, this kind of hunger, literally hunger, you can't wait to jump on the cake, you know? So you catch it. Come on, give it a break, Dalton. Give it, give it to another person. You calm yourself down a bit. Still have your cake, you know? But then the aversion would be when something bad happens, annoying thing, upset thing, wrong thing. Then the, the, the really powerful response to aversion is instead of, because you're pushing it away. You don't want the red light to be there. You don't want that ugly sound. You don't want that ugly feeling in your pain knee. You greet it instead. You you calm it. You, you, and it's, this is a tough one when it's a very beat habit. You learn to change. In other words, you learn to change the way you interpret the pain in the knee. It's not as bad as you think, Rabina. It's okay. You'll handle it. It'll be gone in a minute. The red light, it'll be green in a five seconds, Rabina. Calm down, relax. You kind of talk to yourself. Talk yourself. So you don't, the aversion calms. So you don't wait till you want to be, you know, you want to kill somebody because that's too difficult then. You start with the baby things. So they're basically, when you realize that attachment and aversion both, they're very primordial, way beyond seemingly conceptual, but they are still conceptual stories and we have to catch them and argue. But, with but them. This practice is what cuts out, uh, is at least part of what cuts out kind of the delusion and kind of gets rid of that baggage. That's the point, darling. I mean, slowly, slowly, this goes to very subtle levels, but grabbing these ones when they're small and arguing with them, calm, that's really part of what practice is every day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Dalton. Who else? Yes, go, Merwood. Talk to me, sweetheart. Um, so if we are identifying these habits and we are trying to get rid of them, we are trying to identify them and then relieve the misconceptions and well, release them. Work with them argue with them you know ride with right. them they're all very deep you're gone are we able then to incrementally start to access our subtle mind or is that a leap no you access your subtle mind only when you got you learn concentration meditation so i mean you, okay, put it, now, now put it this way in ordinary daily life if you mainly are in touch with kindness and wisdom and love and generosity and forgiveness you actually are already more subtle because you're more connected to others you're not so isolated in yourself you're not being so self-centered so self-grasping so already you are kind of loosey-goosey you're more connected to others therefore more happy but if we're over but you won't really start to get to the more subtle level until you begin to get um single point of concentration that te meditation technique then you literally go beyond the conceptual at that point that's quite advanced Oh, okay. Okay. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> oh, no, you always say that because you forget. <laughs> oh, I just have to keep answering you. You just have to be delighted the way how far you've come already, but you forget. You just keep seeing how long to go and you get depressed. I know. <laughs> you've really got to practice being happy where you're at and get excited about moving forward. Okay. You have to, darling. You have to. You have to. What choice have you got? Uh, true. Thank you. Have you. To. You must. You've got to do that as well. It's not depressing. You've got to be excited by it and enthusiastic. Can't you do that? Yes. Good. Happy to hear. What else, people? What time are we going to go? Time to go now. It's nine o'clock already. Look at it. Goes so quick, isn't it? God. Well, listen, you people. Food for thought, okay? Are we communicating? Are we communicating? This is Buddhism, all right? <laughs> Talk with an Australian accent. 
But I mean, we can communicate. It's, see, it's sort of, it's, you can see it's not arcane. You can see it's real, tasty, delicious life, right? Because we're putting it in words that we all, how we talk, you know? That's why Lamy Yeshi was so amazing. Lamy Yeshi was, I couldn't believe when I see now how Tibetans are so different in the way they form and structure things. And from the time he met hippies, like in the, in the 70s when I met him, it's like he was born a hippie, you know, but looking like a Tibetan. He just knew how to communicate. I mean, I, I edit his teachings and I, it blows my mind how he had this ability, you know, to talk like we did. It's very powerful. So I'm his daughter, you know, I do my best to try and communicate. So we've got to have optimism. We've got to be optimistic, Mary. Like Mary, not depressed, optimistic. This is a doable job. It's a doable job to unpack and unravel our conceptual stories to the subtlest degree. But even just do it at the gross level, already you're making progress, I tell you. Because then you begin to feel that you're in charge, not some victim of circumstances, some victim of other people, which is how ego feels. You know, like Ego feels completely hopeless. You know. We've got potential. We can mould our mind into any shape we like into the mind of a happy, content, fulfilled, joyful, wise, compassionate person. That's the point. Speaking simply, that's the point. So persevere, everybody. Don't give up. So maybe for like three quality minutes, we can do a little meditation of concentration, but not concentrating on the breath, but this is a Mahamudra meditation. You just concentrate feels a bit weird in the beginning. You just simply pay attention. This is the job to be done. Get yourself straight. Sit up straight. If you're sitting cross-legged, you've got no choice. You'd be toppling over otherwise. But for those of us in chairs, sit up straight. Feet on the ground. And just close your eyes. Be very natural, okay? Be feel very natural. Close your eyes. And just for three quality minutes, we're going to simply pay attention to whatever pops up in your mind. Don't invite it. Don't think it. It's going to come no matter what, I promise. But just pay attention to it. That's it. Don't, no analysis, no discussion. And don't worry about it. It feels a bit weird initially. Just pay attention. Allow the thoughts to come and allow the thoughts to go. Very conscious, very alert. Pay attention to your thoughts. Keep the mind sharp, don't space out, pay attention. That's it, about three minutes, people. Good quality, three minutes, that's it. So we just think, here we've been for 90 minutes, chatting away, thinking, listening, analysing, contemplating, and me too, for sure, thinking, analysing. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. So that we can continue to, you know, take from this. We can take from this, even 1%, try to put it into practice. But go with this confidence that the mind is an infinitely flexible thing. And the crucial point the Buddha's making is that, honey child, what goes on in your mind is the main source of your happiness and suffering. Shocking me enough to us that what goes on in our mind is the main player in our happiness and suffering. That's Buddha's expertise. And we can prove it to be true. Countless times, you know. So we don't give up. 
Changchub, Semcho Grimboche, Makie, Panam Kiguchi, Kepanyampa, Mepa Yang, Gong Ne, Gondu, Pabasho, Gewa Di, Nudu Dug, Lama Sange, Jubu Ne, Droa Tikang, Malupa, De Sala, Gurpa Shoga, say something like that before in Tibetan. And then the other one I said was already make compassion. Grow and grow in the hearts of all. We'll talk about that one day as well. Okay, petals. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you, people. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm coming on